Can you hold on? Go ahead and introduce them. You got your microphone. Do you have a microphone? Uh, no, but I think Jim can hear me, so the microphone is okay, coming through laptop. Hello. Hello, everybody. We have um, uh, a talk today. We're going to do a couple of talks, which is uh, from long distance. And uh, these are people are doing video conferencing presentations to us here live at the uh, University of Washington. And so uh, we have Franklin, who is, go who is our uh, a Saturday morning uh, person who uh, deals with our views and video conferences. He's our host for this. So he'll be hosting this as well. And uh, we have Jim Mar uh, Marison, and he'll be talking about an experiment, a Michael Mor Morley experiment to do that in space, I believe. So uh, let's uh, take it over, and I'll give the uh, hosting over to um, our host, uh, Franklin Hill, and he'll get this started. Yeah, Jim, go ahead. OK. Hi, this is uh, Jim Morrison, uh, talking to you live from uh, beautiful downtown Richfield Park, New Jersey. Um, I was going to uh, include a, uh, a GIF from uh, Monty Python, to, and now for something completely different. So <clears throat> that's my talk. Uh, you can, can, can everyone see the, um, uh, the PowerPoint? Yeah, we can see it fine. So, um, essentially, what I'm uh, proposing, although uh, I'm not the first, uh, is to have a Michelson Morley type uh, interferometer experiment be conducted uh, first in low Earth orbit. Uh, and then, if it shows a positive response, which I'm predicting it will, then in interplanetary space. So a little bit about me first. Um, I'm a retired independent researcher. Uh, for about 30 years, I was uh, worked as a uh, in the information technology computers as a professional. My education uh, included uh, a mechanic, master's in mechanical engineering, majoring in applied science and plasma physics. And I also uh, studied towards a uh, PhD in applied physics at Columbia, but did not complete it. So <clears throat> by introduction, the uh, proposal is simply to conduct a Michelson Morley type experiment in low Earth orbit. Uh, we're predicting that <clears throat> Uh, in contradiction to special relativity, which would uh, predict uh, essentially the same as same results as a terrestrial version of the experiment, essentially null results, uh, we're predicting that it would actually produce a, a result uh, equivalent to the orbital velocity of a spacecraft or low Earth orbit that's about. 7,600 meters per second uh, for a 500 kilo, uh, kilometer altitude orbit, typical orbit. And if uh, it was launched into interplanetary space, essentially between between Mar uh, the Earth and Mars, uh, not has to be far, fairly far away from uh, the Earth, maybe at least two. Uh, two million kilometers or so, it would detect the full orbital uh, <clears throat> uh, solar orbit velocity of the spacecraft, which would be around 30,000 meters per second, and which is the velocity that was sought by uh, almost all the early Michelson Morley type experiments and was not uh, detected. Like I said, this is not a new idea. It's been proposed before. Uh, there's a there's actually a, a letter to Nature that was published in 1986 by two mainstream physicists proposing it, but it's essentially ignored. 
it's because, like I said, the mainstream physics community um, predicts or, or would predict um, that it would just have the same null results that of terrestrial based uh, MMXs, where MMX stands for Michael Zamorley experiment. So the previous proposals have been essentially ignored uh, uh, because they would consider it a waste of time, even though it wouldn't be that difficult to do. Uh, but uh, they proposed, the previous proposals generally just said, hey, it's a, it's a good idea, let's try it. They didn't really have any uh, evidence to uh, suggest that it could succeed or would succeed to have a positive result. So um, we're saying here that um, there actually is evidence that it should have a positive result, basically based on first order phenomenon with uh, light propagation, EM wave propagation, such as the, uh, there's a, a, a thing called the pseudo range correction that's used by GPS receivers because the uh, transmission time of a GPS pulse uh, is, is uh, affected by the rotation of the Earth. So a receiver that's uh, rotating with the Earth on the Earth after the GPS transmits its location signal uh, moves away from the GPS satellite. It takes longer for the pulse to reach the receiver. And that uh, additional time period is uh, effectively the rotational velocity of the Earth at that location, which is typically for 40, 40 uh, degree latitude around 360 meters per second, which is much slower than an orbiting satellite low Earth orbit MMX or solar, or, so solar or, orbiting MMX would detect, would, would um, be, run, be uh, running at. So, um, okay, so, you for a second there, so I want to rewind hello? a little bit there. Yeah, we Your lost question? you for a second there. Uh, no, we lost you for a second there, so you might want to rewind a couple of sentences. You have to speak actually louder because it's coming through only this. Oh, oh, thank you, yeah. So, it can, it can, can you hear me, Jim? Sorry? Can you, can you speak up a little louder? Can you hear me, Jim? Can you hear me, Jim? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, we, we had you cut out there for a few seconds there. You might want to rewind just a little bit. Okay. So, um, right. as I was saying, the... Uh, Pseudo range correction that's part of the uh, GPS standard uh, for uh, calculating uh, location uh, essentially is based on the notion that the Earth is uh, rotating with respect to the Earth centered uh, inertial reference frame uh, and that that's affecting the uh, uh, transmission time essentially is the uh, same as uh, equivalent to an ether wind of that velocity. The second point I'm, I'm, I'd like to make is that uh, MMX type experiments that have been uh, conducted since 1979 have um, shown a um, possible uh, detection of this much lower velocity or ether wind, but uh, they typically uh, uh, dismiss it as noise because it is such a weak signal. Because the um, it's a, it's what the an MMX uh, Morley interferometer is essentially what's called a second order uh, light transmission phenomenon 
because it's because of the reflections from the mirrors, uh, the um, which means that the uh, the, the strength of the signal is based on velocity squared over c squared. So a signal that's one ten one one thousandth uh, or a velocity that's one one thousandth of the uh, expected velocity would actually be uh, 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 a millionth uh, of the strength of a uh, uh, of the magnitude of a uh, of a uh, higher velocity velocity let's say the velocity is a hundred times stronger so that the uh, the strength of the signal would be uh, one ten thousandth uh, of uh, what's what, what, what's expected. Everyone follow me so far, or am I going too fast? Did you want to answer it? Well, anyway, uh, I'll go on. So, um, an MMX conducted in outer space may actually be the only way to provide a unambiguous measurement of a velocity with respect to the interferometer because it would be uh, uh, 22 times or 21 times the velocity of the spacecraft would be 20, 22 times the velocity of the rotation of the Earth which would be a uh, 440 times larger signal, which we, would be much easier to detect. So if it is detected, it would clearly show that the same experiment that led to Einstein's special relativity uh, the negative result, the null result, was uh, not really true. It was just that it was much smaller than what they thought were, they were looking for. Uh, <clears throat> and as we all know, uh, most, if not all, uh, or I should say that the, the, the great majority of uh, mainstream and dissident uh, Physicists, the physics community almost unanimously assumes that if there is an ether, it's what's called the universal ether. It's the same everywhere in the universe, not not moving, not different density, just uh, homogeneous and isotropic. So we're saying here that uh, <clears throat> that's not, we're proposing a different uh, ether model essentially that uh, uh, <clears throat> that the uh, there's a, the, there's a uh, uh, I'll go on go on from there that uh, so uh, what we're trying to show essentially is that the velocity of the receiver is not independent of the motion of the receiver with respect to any reference frame. We're saying that the, that the ECI is actually the Earth-centered inertial, re, inertial reference frame, also called ECI, is the preferred reference frame for light propagation in the vicinity of the Earth. If you go, out, if you go far enough away, you actually switch to the solar Inertial reference frame, and that's what I'm going to try to explain with this uh, alternative ether model. So we're, uh, th that's why we really need to do this experiment because we can't get a high enough velocity to measure to detect unambiguously on the Earth, but it would be a lot easier and to detect when the velocity of the spacecraft is the actual velocity that you're trying to detect with respect to the Earth-centered 
geostate geocentric reference frame. So we go back again to three possibilities for why MMX experiments to date have had no results. The first one, and obviously the one that's uh, the accepted one, it's been accepted since 1905, is that there is no ether, no velocity to that to, that could be could be measured could be measured. No, how many? No matter how precise and sensitive your interferometer was. Uh, and the second possibility is that uh, another possibility is that the interferometer is uh, conceptually uh, not capable of detecting a velocity, even if there was one. And that's sort of what uh, the Lorentz Fitzgerald contraction and the Lorentz transformation were invented to explain this, uh, the null result. Uh, there's a third possibility that I've rarely seen mentioned and that's that uh, essentially what I've been trying to say for the last uh, 10 minutes or so is that uh, there is a velocity and that velocity is the Earth's rotation velocity and that's too low to be detected unambiguously by even the most sensitive microsimulator experiments that have been conducted to date. And that's what I that's what that's what I'm claiming here is, is why there's been a null result and why doing it in outer space would have a positive result because the, if it's velocity with respect to the ECI as as I said that uh, GPS is telling us then <clears throat> the velocity to, to detect would be or the, the magnitude of the uh, of the effect would be much much higher. So I guess I've kind of already gone ahead of myself here. Uh, we have a new or different alternative model of the ether that was first proposed by uh, Peter Beckman. Uh, in 1986 in his book, uh, Einstein plus two, and essentially what led to the formation of this organization. <laughs> uh, and also by a uh, professor of, uh, a deceased professor of uh, electrical engineering in Taiwan, whose name was Ching Chuan Su, who independently came up with virtually the same uh, same uh, ether model. And as I already mentioned, uh, uh, the GPS pseudo range co correction is uh, almost a classical interpretation of that is that uh, the uh, velocity of the receiver is uh, affecting the transmission time and the effective speed of the of the, of, of the microwave pulse because the transmission time takes longer because the receiver is moved from the time that the pulse is emitted to the time that it's received. Uh, essentially uh, an extra distance of approximately V over C squared, where again, V is the velocity of the receiver with respect to the ECI and that velocity is due to the rotation of the earth. Or if there's a, say a jet that's got a GPS receiver, you would add or subtract the velocity of the, uh, of the jet to uh, the uh, relative uh, uh, velocity uh, toward or away from the, uh, the satellite. So, and I was, as I also mentioned already, uh, uh, that uh, experiments from 1979 to the to the present have possibly detected this uh, velocity with their 
much more sensitive versions of uh, uh, Michael Morley experiments. The first was, and uh, it was done in 1979 by Brier and Hall. And instead of using mirrors, they used what's called a Fabre Perot etalon and lasers, and were able to achieve a much higher sensitivity. But they were looking for essentially a Lorentz invariance violation uh, due to uh, some new uh, physics theories at the time called standard model extensions and some other uh, pretty wild stuff if you're trying to understand special relativity. Uh, and they uh, saw a signal that was essentially occurring at a uh, frequency that there was twice the rotation rate of their interferometer because they, they had their interferometer on a uh, <clears throat> on a turning platform with a vertical axis uh, like the uh, original Michael Morley experiment uh, and that's that's uh, totally consistent with uh, the Earth's uh, velocity due to the Earth's rotation. And they also <coughs> had, uh, included data in their uh, report that where they called this signal spurious. But some have analyzed it, particularly uh, uh, Professor Howard Hayden, uh, well, the emeritus of the University of Connecticut, I guess, the same place where we had the last, where the last 2018 uh, CNPS uh, conference was held. And he looked at the data, he looked at their report and he noticed this two, uh, two, two omega, that he called it, uh, signal. And he uh, also noticed that the uh, phase of the signal, the, the direction that it was pointing at, uh, was constant which would also be consistent with uh, a velocity due only to the Earth's rotation. And the magnitude of the signal was uh, maybe twice or half, I forget, of the exact value expected. Uh, but uh, there wasn't really enough data to, uh, to, to uh, make a firm, unambiguous uh, conclusion that the um, in fact, uh, the third characteristic, or I guess it's essentially the fourth characteristic uh, of the signal would be that it would uh, point directly to the, uh, to the east, the east-west, the direction of the signal would be east-west, so the peaks would correspond to uh, that compass direction. But apparently the experimenters did not record uh, that value, how their uh, experiment was uh, oriented. So he wasn't able to to make that conclusion. And as I said, that you know, it, it's the, the signal was was weak enough that it could be considered noise or systematics or whatever you want to call it. So it wasn't an unambiguous detection, essentially. And it's, um, there have been actually some other, even more sensitive experiments, uh, Michael Smorley uh, uh, <clears throat> implementations over the past 20 years or so. Again, looking for these Lorentz uh, invariance violations and standard model exception uh, parameters, uh, completely ignoring the possibility of, of a uh, velocity uh, due to the Earth's rotation. And they also dismissed, they, they also appear, appear to have uh, detected this two omega, twice the rotation rate of the, of the uh, turntable uh, signal and also dismissed it as systematic. And again, it was weak enough that it could be ignored essentially or declared to be just noise.
uh, the uh, uh, the fourth. Uh, well, what I was going to say is that even the most uh, uh, recent and most sensitive experiment by in 2015 reported this to Omega Signal, uh, but they uh, uh, declared that it was probably due to uh, interaction with the, of the turntable with the Earth's magnetic field. So who knows for sure? That's why we might need to do this experiment in outer space because it would give a clear yes or no answer, in my opinion. How are we doing on time? Uh, so um, these recent experiments were uh, used what's called cavity resonators. And it might even be, and they were looking for frequency variations, not phase or fringe shift changes, like the traditional mirror-based uh, Michael experiments. So there, just to, as, a, as an aside here, that uh, an MMX experiment in outer, in, in outer space, lo low Earth orbit or uh, solar orbit would be, uh, have additional uh, advantages uh, since there would be no vibration from people walking on the sidewalk to uh, cause, uh, fluctuations or it's a great vacuum so you can have you know you won't have to struggle with uh, air currents or temperature uh, uh, gradients although you might want to shield it from the sun from sunlight and also because it's in microgravity it would be very easy to uh, orient it in any direction you want and give it any rotation about any axis that you want so you can try all sorts of different uh, possibilities there. You can even uh, point it at the uh, uh, CMBR dipole, which is uh, uh, supposedly in the constellation Leo <clears throat> uh, at 11 hours right ascension and six uh, degrees declination, uh, which is what uh, some have tried to claim that uh, they've been able to uh, detect the velocity with uh, uh, terrestrial-based experiments. So it'd be a good experiment to try even just for that reason. So um, where do, what is all this based on? It's based on this, uh, what I call, and what Ching Chuan Su called uh, the local ether model. Uh, essentially that uh, the uh, ether is actually, has a variable density that's proportional to the local gravitational potential generated by simply the, the mass of a celestial, ob celestial object like the earth or the sun and this uh, halo uh, is, is is denser near the, the surface of the of the body, and uh, it gets weaker the farther away you get until you reach a, a boundary where the uh, uh, local ether of a larger body uh, becomes dominant, and essentially you switch reference frames to the uh, the larger body, such as the sun. So so. We're estimating that it's about the same distance. The, the transition distance is pro probably about the same as uh, the uh, L1 or L2 Lagrange points, where the gravitational force no longer points at the Earth, uh, points towards the Sun. And that's about roughly a, a million kilometers from this, in the center of the Earth, well past the uh, distance to the moon of 230, uh, excuse me, 300 odd kilometers, 300,000 odd kilometers. So this looks like a halo, and it, uh, it's kind of similar to a halo, 
uh, in a lot of ways because it, its density varies. And uh, <clears throat> the other, the, the main, there's, there's two main postulates for this, that this halo is at rest with the Earth-centered inertial reference frame, or for the sun would be the sun-centered inertial reference frame. It doesn't rotate. Uh, it always points in the same direction in the sky, just like the gravi gravitational potential effectively does. Uh, <clears throat> so the uh, uh, here, here's a, a rough diagram of uh, Sue's model. Uh, you can see the Earth here, surrounded by its local halo of ether. And it, so the, its halo is carried with the Earth in its orbit, but the Earth rotates inside it, sort of like, uh, as uh, Peter Beckman put it, like uh, a woman in a hoop, hoop skirt uh doing a uh a spin but the hoop skirt is not attached to her so she spins but the hoop skirt doesn't uh and you can see that the, here's jupiter it has a larger uh halo because the uh it's strong entire mass so it extends out further to where the sun takes over and then the solar system, maybe uh, maybe out to even out to two light years from the uh, from the sun, uh, has the sun's local ether, and then the the galaxy's local ether eventually becomes dominant. The Milky Way galaxies. So um, I, I'm hoping some people have some questions about this local ether model. I'd be glad to explain it more, but I think I'm going to just uh, go on to some practical considerations of uh, uh, how to get this experiment accomplished. So the general phys physics community believes that it's a waste of time and it essentially even ignores uh, proposals to, to do it. And the space agencies like NASA also ignore proposals. Uh, and probably even other nations, space agencies would too. They, they, no one would dare sponsor this mission or project uh, for fear of being ridiculed. But a privately funded project, I think, is now approach is is now conceivable uh, <clears throat> because there are now private companies that will launch a spacecraft for you as long as you pay them the money. They're not they hopefully are not going to care too much about uh, whether you're, the nature of your of, of what you're launching as long as it's not going to cause a problem. Uh, and one such company is uh, called Rocket Lab, which I actually just saw today, uh, they had their seventh successful orbital launch. So they actually have rockets that uh, can put a, a spacecraft, a small spacecraft into orbit. There's also now a technology called CubeSat, which uh, essentially allows you to build a satellite out of uh, a, a tiny satellite, like a uh, couple of kilograms out of uh, off the shelf components and have most of the uh, pieces that you need to have a, a working satellite. <laughs> and the, uh, the, the electron rocket that, space, that Rocket Lab is close there, their uh, standard rocket, uh, also supports uh, multiple different projects to uh, share a, a launch. So you only have to pay for part of the launch cost, which uh, could be as low as 
a half a million dollars, which is not peanuts, but not uh, billions either. <laughs> so uh, even even greater uh, help now is that Rocket Lab is uh, is uh, is advertising a, a service to uh, essentially build your sp satellite for you, design it and build it, and provide the uh, common components that you need for a satellite, like uh, control and communications and uh, power and thrust, and hopefully, I guess, gyros to uh, maintain orbitable orbit position. So I'm making a super wild ass guess here that you could do the whole project for, say, under $2 million, in which case, in, where, and, and that brings it down to a range where it used to be $10 million just to uh, uh, approach a, a space launch company with uh, proposal to uh, launch a satellite. <clears throat> so it's, it's a lot cheaper now is my point. And even more important, you don't have to pass a, uh, a committee that's going to probably not even consider your proposal <laughs> once they know what it is. So it brings a, uh, this idea of crowdfunding uh, as a possibility to at least raise part of the money uh, and maybe convince a, a wealthy donor to uh, help out. So assuming we could get the, uh, uh, the project uh, into space and if it does detect uh, this uh, approximately 7,600 meters per second velocity, then, uh, then you might be able to convince uh, national space agencies to replicate it. So because, you know, just one private company doing this, they're, they're gonna probably ignore it or uh, think it's just a mistake, an error, Deny it, deny it, deny. <laughs> uh, but you know, if you can get some other more reputable, more credentialed, uh, maybe universities to uh, do the replication, then people might, more people might take notice. And getting funding for interplanetary, the interplanetary version uh, uh, becomes a lot uh, more likely to be you know, sponsorship of, of that uh, proposal. So in conclusion, I reiterate that perform conducting an MMX in outer space might be considered high risk, but it has the potential of a very high impact slash reward, which would be to overturn, overturn Einstein's relativity. And it wouldn't just be special relativity because as Einstein said, general relativity, his general relativity is founded on the base of special relativity. Uh, and he, he said that if it's like, a house, it's like a house, if the first floor, floor caves in, then the second floor will also cave in. I believe I found that quote somewhere. Well, it's similar, similar, uh, similar quote. Or so <clears throat> let's let's say we do succeed, and we, the whole question of special relativity is brought into question. Then you need a you're going to want a replacement model. So there's a, so. And I'm proposing that the Beckman Sioux local ether model is an excellent candidate to replace Einstein's relativity. It's uh, obviously not fully developed, but uh, there are a lot of uh, phenomena that it doesn't uh, hasn't been hasn't been explained. You know, it's essentially two people, two uh, two two uh, individuals, but. It would put physics back in the right track, and other people could extend it and apply it to other experiments, other phenomena, excuse me. And so, my final point here is that 
uh, billions have been spent on unsuccessful attempts to detect hypothetical dark matter particles. So why not try this experiment? It could be done for probably a few million, which would be a lot potentially more useful. Oh yeah, and by the way, one more little kicker here is that this local ether sounds a lot to me like it could be the substance of dark matter. That it's not these exotic particles. It's, it's actually the ether. So any questions? Can you hear us? Uh, no, I, I can hear you now. Okay, so you guys got some questions? We're done? I'm sure we can. This time you got to get close to the microphone. You won't hear it. Not here, unless you do. Am I on? Yeah. Is your ether uh, a stationary ether with respect to, let's say, let's the concept of absolute space and so any velocities that would be detected or due solely to the motion of the observer? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, my uh, audio is not is, is uh, kind of weak. Can you, can you repeat that? Is, is your assumption that the ether is stationary with respect to, let's say, the concept of absolute space and so that any Velocity detected for the ether would be due solely to the motion of the observer, which would be, I guess, in your case, the spacecraft. Um, I'm sorry, it's I'm really having trouble uh, hearing the whole question. Okay, one more time, go ahead. Is your concept of the is your concept for an ether a stationary ether with respect to absolute space? such that any detected velocity of the ether would be due solely to the motion of the interferometer on the spacecraft. No, that's the whole point, is that uh, we're saying that uh, it's not absolute with respect to all space, that it's... Uh, is there uh, ether in... Does sorry? Intergalactic, is there ether? Sorry? Is there ether intergalactically? Yeah, the ether is everywhere, but it uh, is. Uh, Does ether move? Sorry. Does ether move? Yeah, it, it uh, is uh, essentially. In, it's like an entrained ether that is carried with the celestial body as like a halo around it. So ether but, only move. Ether in interplanetary intergalactic space is stationary. It only moves. If there's matter that's in its vicinity. Well, actually, uh, <clears throat> this uh, hierarchy of local ethers, uh, like that diagram I showed you, uh, you know, outside of a planet you, uh, in the solar system, you've got the sun's local ether, and then if you go far enough away from uh, the edge of the solar system, maybe two light years away, you uh, get uh, into uh, the galaxy's local ether. And then around the galaxy, there's probably uh, uh, a local ether associated with the local galactic cluster. Then you've got the, uh, or local group, and farther and farther away, you've got the Virgo cluster that the local group is part of. And then maybe you get uh, into uh, intergalactic space and at some point you get to where the CMBR is uh, probably uh, relatively static. Does that make any sense? I, I believe so. Okay, cool. Um, James, this is David Hilster. I've got a question. Um, if, if ether's entrained, is it the case that you, I would think then you would not, you would see a null effect? But yeah, the, um, that uh, is it, the uh, maybe you missed the, you, uh, the I'm, I'm not, 
I'm sorry, maybe you missed an essential point I was trying to make is that uh, this mo ether model, this local ether model, the uh, ether moves with it in, uh, with the earth, for example, in its orbit, uh, it's in train in its orbit, but it doesn't rotate with the earth's rotation. It's essentially, do you know what the ECI is? The earth centered initial reference frame? I understand. So, okay, the Earth is rotating within the entrained ether, right? Exactly. Just like the gravitational potential doesn't rotate with the Earth, it points to a fixed direction in space, essentially. Okay, but the Michelson Morley experiment is to show the whole idea came from the earth is moving through a sea of ether and that there was direction uh, of the uh, the earth uh, was like moving in water so there should be a direction and therefore we should measure uh, light different at different times perhaps so that's why they did it in seasons etc why would that be different in um, I don't understand in the space part why that would resolve a problem like that. Well, see, if you've got an entrained ether around you, this halo of ether that is the unique inertial reference frame for all EM wave propagation, including light, it would essentially block the uh, emotion due to the Earth's orbital or the solar system's uh, galactic orbit. And that's why you would, that's why the, uh, the velocity, the, velocity of the, the ether wind's velocity would be only due to the Earth's rotation. It would not, there, and that's what GPS shows you. GPS shows no effect of the Earth's orbital motion, but it does show an effect of the Earth's rotational motion. Are you proposing the experiment take place outside of the halos? Outside of what? The halos, the entrained ether. No, well, the, the initial experiment would be done within the halo because the halo goes out to probably way past the, the moon. Uh, so the initial experiment would be uh, done in low Earth orbit, maybe five to five hundred kilometers up, uh, or on the space station. Except that they would never do it on the space station, <clears throat> uh, and the, the the velocity or the ether wind that this interferometer would be trying to detect would be the orbital velocity of the spacecraft with respect to the halo or the, the ECI. Okay, so you're saying that the, mo uh, the, ha the halo or the entrained ether is stationary and that the experiment would be moving and because of that, you can then detect the difference uh, using the yes, yeah, the movement of the spacecraft, which is much which is much higher velocity than the Earth's rotation, that makes it easier to detect the uh, uh, the ether wind. To propel it to that velocity, do you need a uh, SpaceX Falcon Heavy? Well, SpaceX uh, basically just puts a satellite into Earth orbit most of, most of the time. Uh, well, what I'm saying is if you want to make a velocity in an orbit, you've got to really put it on a rocket that does a more, perhaps, at least get it to a speed you want. So that means when you put things in synchronous orbit, you don't have to add additional velocity. So do you see that you would want to put this at a certain velocity around the orbit, uh, orbit of the Earth? Well, um, the orbital velocity of the spacecraft is uh, essentially just due, uh, 
constrained by its altitude. So if you try to give it a higher velocity, you might launch it into a higher orbit. But in that orbit, since it's farther away, it's like v squared over r or something. That, uh, the orbital velocity actually decreases as you go farther away. And so you get out to geostationary distance around uh, 3,600. Uh, have, 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 have you done any calculations for velocities, orbits, and what you may expect in the actual experiment? I'm sorry, I missed some. It's the, the, my, uh, no, no, problem. no problem, no problem. My question is, did you do any calculations to the orbit or where the velocity and what you might expect if you were to do this, the calculations as simulating what you think would happen? Well, actually, uh, yeah, for 500 kilometers, if you, look, you can look it up on Wiki. Uh, it's 7,600 miles, uh, miles per, meters per second. 76, 7,600 meters per second for a 500 kilometer orbit. Now, the, the, the closer, the, the lower the orbit, the higher your velocity. So that would be better, I guess, because uh, the higher velocity, the easier to detect a, a, a signal. Uh, <clears throat> but as you get, as your velocity, as your orbit gets lower, you start running into atmospheric drag and your orbit decays much quicker. Okay, thank you. Uh, Duncan Shaw uh, speaking. Um, I'm thinking of what the, some commentators have called the cocooning effect of ether surrounding the Earth. And uh, the idea of being that uh, the instruments on the Earth that have carried out the MM experiments and similar experiments uh, are cocooned uh, from the brunt of the uh, meeting of ether during orbital speed. Uh, it, 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 an analogy could be that when you're driving a car at 100 miles an hour and it's a convertible and you raise your hand you can feel the uh, effect of the wind as you're going driving but if you're inside a car you don't feel anything at all and uh, which reasoning might put into uh, question uh, whether the experiments carried out on the Earth's surface, surface are of uh, any real significant value at all, i.e., let's get out into space and see what the readings are there. Is, is, is there any element of that involved in uh, how you uh, uh, see the, this ex experiment? in space or in orbit uh, carried out? Well, I could, I'm trying to say is that uh, <clears throat> that uh, the uh, experiment should show the Earth's, it should, should, should show a wind shift equivalent to uh, the 7600 meters per second orbital velocity of the spacecraft. Uh, so I guess, yes, <laughs> let's do it in outer space. Let's get some, some people together and get some, get some kind of a organization going and get it done. Be famous. Any more questions, please? No? Okay, thank you so much, uh, James. Uh, we'll be stopping the recording here, um, and uh, we appreciate your.